piano, and then we'll pull the piano, kind of swap, and yeah. try to get them. Yep. yep. So two choruses on the tag. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I think so.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. We appreciate you guys again. It's always good to see you. I think I said that last week, but I'll probably say it every week. Thank you so much. Um, small crew today, but you ready to go, Chuck? All right, we're ready. This is one of my favorite tunes because it has 808 bass drum in it. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I love it. Here you go. Good God Almighty. I can't count the times I've called your name some broken night. You showed up and patched me up. Like you do every time I get amnesia I forget that you keep coming around There ain't no way you ever let me down Good God Almighty I hope you'll find me Praising your name no matter what comes Cause I know where I'd be without
scripture readings from John 13 verses 1 through 5. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. This is the word of the Lord.
greatness of His mercy and love at the feet of Jesus, and we cry, Holy, 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 and we cry, Holy, 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 and we. be seated. I'm Jill McMullen. I'm the Minister of Care and Welcome to Connect, and it's great to be with you this morning. And we're at the time in our service where we get to send our kids off to Sunday school. So if you're near a kid, hold out your hand, and we're going to pray for our kids before we send them. Jesus, thank you for kids and the energy they bring and the excitement they bring and the hope they bring. And we ask that you would fill these kids with your Holy Spirit as they go to learn more about you and deepen their little faiths. Be with um, our teachers as they lead them. Thank you for this opportunity we've had to be with them. And now we send them to go learn and have some more fun. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So everybody, you can go. Have fun. <laughs> Bye, kids. I love this service because at this point, now that we have the kids and we do this dismissal, like half the room empties out, which is good, which is good. It just means there's tons of kids here, which we love. <laughs> Bye, kids. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. Something special going on in this room today. I don't know if you can feel it. I can feel it. I'm excited. Maybe it's just because we hung out with Charismatics all weekend. Talk about that in a minute, uh, but uh, I'll try to stay on script. It, you know, when you hang out with Charismatics, who knows what's going to happen, right? Do we have any charismatic people who grew up in a charismatic or Pentecostal background at this church? No? No? Nobody? Okay. So maybe you don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we're going to get into it. We're on our, our fourth of five looks at 
spiritual battle. And we're going to tackle a big one today. Um, Let's get into it, yeah. Let's pray, actually. Holy Spirit, come. We've made room, we make room. We want you to be in our minds and in our hearts. There's really no point of any of this if you're not. I want this to be your time. Speak into the lives of all the people gathered here and online. May it be so in your name and for your glory. Amen. So there are many uh, years or dates, uh, certainly years in U.S. history that most of us would recognize as important. For example, 1776 is one. I hope. We recognize 1865, another one, maybe even 1863 that we should recognize. 1969, for a lot of reasons, a lot went down that year. 2001, and many, many more. But I wonder who knows what happened on December 23rd, 1783. And don't say it was two days before Christmas, because that's true. On that date, Commander-in-Chief of the Army... General George Washington, you may have heard of him, stood before Congress in Annapolis, Maryland, and resigned his commission in the the military, relinquishing officially his power over the future of the new country. Many people in Europe and in America thought that Washington would assume primary control over the colonies and even maybe become their king. When we look at history, it's important we look at history through history's eyes and not through our own. Because today, if someone said that, like on the campaign trail, by the way, I'm thinking maybe king, we would all... But then, it was actually a very natural thing to think, because for centuries and centuries and centuries, that is what conquering military generals did. And so it was very natural for people to go, oh, I get it. He will now be King Washington, okay? By the way, uh, in the world today, if we're, uh, if we're not aware of it, that is still the way of the world today. Across the world in various places is when there is a military, a conquering military leader, they then assume control over the place they just conquered. But that is not what George Washington did. He retained perspective on the purpose of the revolution, which which was for the people to govern themselves. And more important, he maintained perspective on his own limitations as one human being. Consider this quote from his letter. I consider it an indispensable duty to commend the interests of our dearest country to the protection of Almighty God. In this fourth week of our battle plan, we're making a plan against a spiritual opponent that is so ubiquitous, meaning it's everywhere, so insidious, meaning it gets into everything like sand, and so destructive that many have called it the root of all sin, while amazingly, some people don't think it's sinful at all. For our monastic mentor, Evagrius, who we've been talking about this whole series, it took on two forms, which he called pride and vainglory, which is a wonderful old-fashioned word, vainglory. You should try to parent your children that way. Don't, don't come at me with that vainglory. Basically vanity, right? Vanity and pride, even in Evagrius, have a lot in common, so I've lumped them into one heading, that is pride. We're talking about pride today. Now, as I've done for the last couple of weeks, I'd like to summarize some of the many ways that Evagrius experienced pride. Because get this, these opponents, they don't come right at us with fangs and claws. If they did, they'd be obvious, they'd be easier to fight. They don't do that. We don't really see pride in our own hearts and in our minds as is, I'm the best, I'm the best, and you are dumb. <laughs> no one does that, that's a cartoon. And pride doesn't come at us that way, does it? Not really. If it did, we'd, 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 we'd see it. Evagrius experienced it in a lot of ways, like all of these, such as, my thoughts are important and must be shared with others. That's in Evagrius. People should care what I do. 
He was tempted to compare himself to others, tempted to gossip, tempted to envy. And all this 17 centuries before social media. Now we get to carry around little devices in our pockets that every few minutes tempt us to share the world what we think. He also had thoughts like, I don't deserve to suffer. I don't need to listen to advice, especially from my elders. I don't need people to pray for me. Have you ever had somebody offer to pray for you and your instinct is to go, oh, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. It's not that you're the biggest sinner ever, but when we resist people's offer to pray for us, that's pride stepping in. And he felt it too 1,700 years ago. These are just a few. Pride in some ways is even trickier than our previous tempting powers because at least we can see the destructive potential of gluttony and lust and um, uh, anger and, and despair. But pride, is it even bad? If you grew up in the church, you'd be like, yeah, it's bad. I know it's bad. But, but is it? Does the world think it is? Listen to the dictionary definitions of pride. Pride, a feeling that you respect yourself and deserve to be respected by other people. Self-respect. Pride, a feeling of happiness at an accomplishment. Now these aren't wrong, but they're also not vices. They're not bad. Finally, pride, a feeling that you are more important or better than other people. That's where the dictionary starts leaning toward vice. Right? Of course, there is such a thing as healthy pride. Have you ever heard of that or thought that? Healthy pride? Yeah, some nods. It's okay. Yeah, there is healthy pride. The Bible is clear. Human beings are special. Human beings amongst all the creatures of the world are special. Genesis 1 declares that people are made to reflect God's characteristics. The phrase is, we are made in the image of God. We were meant to reflect God's characteristics. It's how we're built. God has, quote, crowned them, humans, with glory and honor, rulers over all creation, says Psalm 8. In John's revelation at the end of the Bible, the, those who were worshiping God said, you have made humanity to be a kingdom, and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Human beings are special. Even Shakespeare knew it. As he said in Hamlet, What a piece of work is a man in action, how like an angel in apprehension, how like a God. But forces opposed to God, that is Satan, the world, and even ourselves, which is the Bible calls the flesh, Forces opposed to God easily inflate our God-given dignity. That is, that, that part of us that reflects God, God-given dignity. Those forces inflate that dignity into an insistence that we can be our own gods. This is when healthy pride gives way to destructive pride. The enemy of God is an expert at making good things bad. You can quote me on that. Expert at making good things bad. In the Garden of Eden, this is exactly how the serpent tricked the man and woman, telling them that they were special. You're special, which is true or false, folks. True. But somehow then he twisted it just so that he convinced them that they had not been made special enough. No, 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 you're special. But God is holding something back from you. You could be more special if you take matters into your own hands. That's how he got them. And that's how he gets us. Pride tempts us to displace God and enthrone the self. From last fall, our series gave the framework for the conflict between two opposing plans of salvation. If you were here for that, you'll recognize this. If you weren't, you can go back and catch up like I mentioned last week. Use the app, listen to those sermons. The top row outlines salvation plan based on the self. The bottom row, God's salvation plan based on Jesus Christ. Now, the first two lead up to the human problem. The last two act out and live out the solution, it's that middle banner 
that is the solution. And you can see how they oppose each other. So in essence, the world's salvation, and I'm going to be bold here, the world's salvation plan comes from the serpent. It is exactly what the serpent tells the man and woman in the garden. That is, God didn't make you good enough. But you can be on your own terms. But God's word claims the opposite. And thank God, because let me tell you something, I forgot to say at the first service. Pride is a force that wants you to cannibalize yourself. Like a snake eating its own tail. Don't forget, the enemy doesn't want your loyalty. The enemy doesn't want you at all. Pride wants you to cannibalize yourself. But God doesn't. So we're going to turn to our battle plan, which is to talk back to pride. We're going to use Scripture, of course, always, and learn a little bit about righteousness as well. Scripture today is Matthew 20. It's the first book of the New Testament, Matthew 20, verses 20 to 28. At this point, Jesus' disciples were sure that his kingdom, the kingdom he talked about so much, was going to happen during their lifetimes. It was going to be fulfilled during their lifetimes. They expected it to be uh, uh, basically an earthly kingdom that Jesus would be the king of. So keep that in mind as we get going. Let's listen for God's word starting in verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, that is James and John, came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want? Jesus asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard this, the other disciples, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, <clears throat> You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be the first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's clear that pride is at work here, and it gives us some details about our battle plan against pride, at least as we're looking at it today. Pride is such a formidable foe that it's really a, a, a foe that we'll be battling our whole life, right? So today we're going to look at three aspects of how we can do that. First, we're going to talk back to pride by needing our community, by needing other people. James and John and their mother were part of an integrated community whom Jesus intentionally called together, to operate together. Thankfully, by the time Acts chapter 2 rolls around, they start to get that. They start to understand that. But they don't understand it here. They, they try to separate themselves from the rest. They boldly claim they can absolutely drink this mysterious cup that Jesus is referring to. In the Hebrew Bible, the cup is a symbol of suffering, even of God's wrath sometimes. In the gospel accounts, it always refers to Jesus' humiliation and crucifixion. Now, to what extent James and John understood that symbolism, we, we can't know. But we can be confident they knew the Hebrew Bible. And so their answer, yes, we can do that, is admirable. It's confident, it's faithful, but it's also naive and proud for two reasons. One, Jesus' question, can you drink the cup I'm going to drink, it's meant to illustrate a profound irony. Leon Morris writes, to ask to be honored in Jesus' kingdom is to show that one has not understood what the kingdom is. 
It is impossible to seek greatness for oneself in it. Ironic. In other words, James and John are still operating on the world's terms of what a kingdom is. And, and we can hardly blame them. How could they have known differently, right? But that is what they're doing. Not in terms of God's kingdom. Second, they're being proud and naive because consider what this does to the dynamic of the rest of the group. What does this suggest about the other disciples? What about their faithfulness? What about their bravery? Did it matter or, or did only James and John matter? You can almost hear the other ten. Oh, okay, I get it. Right? They tried to separate themselves as though they didn't need the rest of the group. And oh boy, they did. Their pride tainted their virtue when they tried to be sufficient on their own. Just this week, our daughter's class was reading the famous baseball poem, Casey at the Bat. You guys know that poem? You ever heard of that? Casey at the Bat? Mighty Casey needs only a hit to save the game, but he's too proud of his own talent. He, he intentionally lets the first pitch just go right by him. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. Casey proudly watches the second pitch go by him for strike two because he's confident he only needs one chance. And then he swings at the third pitch. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere and somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing and somewhere children shout, but there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. By trying to be self-sufficient, Casey's arrogance burdens his team and even his whole town. C.S. Lewis wrote, Other vices, I love this, other vices may sometimes bring people together. You can find good fellowship among drunken people. It's true. But pride always means enmity. It is enmity. End quote principalities that oppose God want to foster that enmity, especially if it can reinforce the illusion that you are better than them. If that, once that's in there, it's just a matter of time before enmity takes root. And you know something? The enemy of God has been doing this for centuries and centuries, maybe even millennia. You know why? It works. If it didn't work, he wouldn't do it. But it does. But only when we let it. That's the good news. Only when we let it, we actually end up being the ones with power if we're willing to access that power. James and John forgot they needed their community, so we must not forget. Later today, this week, here is a homework assignment for you. It's as homeworky as I can possibly make it. Make a list. Is there anything more homeworky than that? Take an inventory of your family, your friends, your coworkers, your church community. Wherever your sphere is, make an inventory of the people you need. Not just the people you like, the people you need. Thank God for those people. Celebrate your need. Celebrate. You cannot do this on your own. Make it go from here where everybody's thinking right now, I know that. I know we know that. We need to feel that and celebrate it. Then pride runs into the dark where it belongs. Because pride can't live when we celebrate our need of other people. You want to take it another step? Pick up the phone. Really old-fashioned phone, I guess. It's, this is the new sign language for phone. Pick up the phone. Text somebody. Whatever. Do you dare to let someone know how much you need them? If that scares you, that's pride. Think about it. Let somebody know how much you need them and how much you appreciate them this week. I'd love to hear some stories, by the way, of what happens. Um, when we do that, pride runs and hides. 
and the members of our community feel more honored as well. And that's really the second part of our battle plan. We're going to talk back to pride by needing other people, but we're also going to do it by honoring other people. Verse 24 from today's passage. When the others heard what James and John asked for, they were, love this word, indignant. That's a word i got to work into my vocab more often. They were indignant, angry, right? Because they felt dishonored. Why wouldn't they? James and, John, James and John tried to elevate themselves and therefore by default put the others down. So they felt dishonored. But the other ten aren't actually off the hook either. Their anger showed their own cards, their own pride. They weren't righteously angry with some kind of holy humility. They weren't looking at each other going, this is spiritually unhealthy for James and John. I hope they learn. It's terrible for them. No, they were indignant because they were like, who do these guys think they are? What if I want to sit by Jesus? So that's why Jesus calls all of them together. They all, it's a learning moment, everyone. Come here. Um, they had the same self-interest as James and John, really. James and John had a superiority complex. We're the best. But the other ten had an inferiority complex. What about us? Timothy Keller notes that a superior, this is so good, a superiority complex and an inferiority complex are basically the same. They are both results of being overinflated. Keller wrote that in a, like a 50 page pamphlet called Freedom of Self Forgetfulness. The former claims victory, the latter claims victim. But both are utterly self-interested. And the more self-interested we are in any category, really, the less we're able to honor anyone but ourselves, or at least honor anyone as much as we honor ourselves. As Aaron and I have said on and off through this series, there are always times when uh, we have to recognize if we truly are a victim, and those times are valid and need to be um, addressed. And we're not talking about those kinds of times. We're talking about victimhood as a mentality. Okay? You see the difference? I'll make sure I'm sensitive to that. Okay. When we are so self-interested that we think we're better than or really think we're worse than, then we feed our pride and Satan can drive a wedge between us and, and, and other people. A few weeks ago, NFL wide receiver Antonio Brown topped the sports headlines. Anybody hear about this story? Hands up. I really am kind of curious to see who knows. Yeah, yeah, many of us. Um, I'm, I may not say exactly what you think I'm going to say, or, or I might. <laughs> Antonio Brown topped the headlines when he unexpectedly quit his job in the middle of a game on the sidelines by ripping off his pads and jersey and shirtlessly walking through the tunnel at that moment, effectively quitting his job. Okay. Now, Brown explained later that a coach... Uh, the head coach wanted him to play on a weak and injured ankle, putting him at risk. Whether or not he had a valid complaint, which looks like he did, by the way, which is a different story, but whether or not his complaint was valid, it's the way he expressed himself that is the point. By doing what he did, he dishonored many people. He dishonored his teammates because what do they get to do next time they have a beef with the coach? Do they get to do that too? He dishonored his coaches and his staff. Remember, it's not just one coach. It's a whole staff. He dishonored them. Are they truly incapable? Are they truly evil? No. What about his fans? Did he dishonor all the people who paid for a ticket that day, many of whom paid to see Antonio Brown play? And finally, and this is the most ironic of all, I think Antonio Brown dishonored himself, asterisk, I believe he, he dishonored the Antonio Brown whom God made. The Antonio Brown whom God made talented. The Antonio Brown whom God had a plan for and wants, still wants, to use his talents to God's glory and to bless the world. I think that Antonio Brown is also dishonored. Now, I don't think he's beyond hope. I watched a thorough interview with him. My empathy deepened. I highly recommend if you're sitting in judgment over Antonio Brown, to watch the interview. But as I watched and my empathy for him deepened, I can't ignore the way the interview ended when he said, quote, I always do what's best for me. 
I know, Antonio. I know. But before we do judge Antonio Brown, we really do have to hold the mirror up to ourselves and ask, do I do the same? Here's the part that convicted me about that. When I wake up in the morning, who am I thinking about? When I make most of my choices, ultimately, who's the primary player in my mind? And finally, is there really that big of a difference between me and Antonio Brown, or am I just better at covering it up than he is? I don't know, but that's something to think about. If you know that it's time to start putting others before yourself, if you're weary of thinking about yourself, which is a wearying burden to bear, if you're done cannibalizing yourself by constantly thinking, me, 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 if you're weary like I am of that, then here's a couple of things we can do. I think one of the ways we can honor other people is by listening to them. Jill and I and five others uh, went this weekend to the Alpha Conference, thanks Jill, where this was the theme. Love listens. We talked about it and we meditate on this at length. Listening to others is an excellent start and practice for honoring others. One speaker said, listening is not the absence of talking. Listening is paying full attention to someone else's life. Consider the example of Jesus. Here he was, the eternal Word of God, through whom the entire cosmos was created. And what's the first thing he says in today's passage? It's a question. What is it you want? Jesus asked dozens and dozens and dozens of questions, and then Jesus listened. He honored people. What makes Alpha special is not what we teach. It's how we listen. We know that if someone on Alpha does not feel heard, we are failing at why we're there. I know it sounds like a plug, <laughs> and it is. That's why it sounds like it. But the next chance you have to experience Alpha is a week from today. February 6th, 530, right outside those glass doors. We're going to have dinner. We're going to watch the video, and then you get a chance to say what you think about what you said in that video. And we, we listen. We listen. And it's a joy to listen. When we listen, thanks, Joel. Huh. When we listen, we honor someone else. And here's the most amazing thing about the kingdom of God. When we try to elevate ourselves, we inevitably put other people down. It's like a seesaw, right? But in the kingdom of God, when we lift someone else up, what happens to us? Do we get put down? We get lifted up too. This is the economy of God's kingdom. Jesus even said, whoever humbles themselves will be lifted up. He says it just three chapters later. When we listen to people, we're more attuned to their life. We're more attuned to their needs. And so the final part of our battle plan against pride is to talk back by serving our community. Jesus could hardly be any clearer on this point. Whoever wants to become great amongst you must be your servant. Each week in this series, we've looked at a spiritual opponent. We've looked at it through Scripture. But we've also drawn a parallel with what the Apostle Paul calls the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. The armor of God. Against anger, we wear the boots of peace. Against overindulgence, we wear the belt of truth. Against despair, we hold the shield of faith. And what about pride? We wear what Paul calls the breastplate of righteousness. And here's the freeing thing. This is the, called the armor of whom? The armor of who? I know I don't do that a lot, but i got to have you say it one more time. And so the breastplate of righteousness is whose righteousness? It's God's righteousness that protects us. We can try, and we should. But the question is, what is God's righteousness? What is that piece of armor? And again, Jesus says it very clearly again in this passage. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. That is is the definition of righteousness in God's kingdom, his servanthood. 
Jesus did not serve as a relinquishment of who he was and what he had been given. Jesus served as the expression of who he was and what he was given. The scripture Lisa read for us says it best. John chapter 13. The night before Jesus died, the night before he died, Jesus famously got on his knees and he washed the feet of his followers in a radical role reversal. But listen to how the Apostle John starts that story. I am embarrassed that I missed this all these years. Don't miss it. John writes, quote, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. So, therefore... He began to wash his disciples' feet. It's what he chose to do with his power. Choosing to be a servant like Jesus does not mean relinquishing who you are or what God has given you. It it means putting that power to use in his service. Gary Thomas writes, Humility changes the inner reality and the attitude with which we view the talents that God has given us. That's what humility does. The good news is that serving others must begin in the simplest way, which happens to be the most powerful way of all. I'm more convicted of this right now than I maybe ever have been. How does service begin? This weekend at the conference, uh, the Alpha Conference, I went to a breakout along with Jill uh, entitled Prayer in Advance of Mission. It was about why and how prayer must precede everything we do. Not every church program we do, everything we do. During the session, we began to pray together as a group, and as we made room for the Holy Spirit, there was 50 or 60 of us in the room, The woman leading the time began to share some words and some images that she had coming to her mind in case they meant anything to anyone in the room. And at one point she said, I'm seeing an image of someone's head. Someone who suffers from migraines or another issue with your head. My eyes welled up with tears because since December 20th till this morning, Almost every single day, save a few, I have wakened up in the middle of the night suffering from cluster headaches. So I cried. And then a woman near me came over and she asked if she could put a hand on my shoulder and pray for me. And I said, yes. And she prayed for me. And the tears flowed into my mask. (laughs) It's one of the moments I'm glad to be wearing a mask. Here's what's interesting about that. Uh, I went to bed that night thinking, come on, baby. (laughs) And then I woke up a few hours later with a headache. And that's okay. Because pain or no pain, I was served in that room by knowing that I was not forgotten about and that I was not alone in the middle of the night with my headaches. God may tell me one day why he lets me go through that, and that's okay with me too. But that's service. That's how service begins and ends and everything in between when we're serving people in the name of Jesus Christ. It's the difference between being kind and bringing kingdom into someone's life. So we battle pride by serving others, and there's innumerable ways to do that, and all of them need to be considered. So prayer does not replace action, as you may be thinking about service, but prayer must happen with action. As it's been said, anything not born in prayer is born in pride. And that can include even our acts of service. So here's what we can do this week, more homeworky language. <laughs> homeworky, that's a fun new word. If you're new to prayer, or if you kind of go, oh, prayer, I don't feel really comfortable in it, that's okay. Start with the people who come to your mind most naturally. 
It's going to be your family or your friends, perhaps, or whomever comes to your mind naturally to pray on their behalf. Start with them and make it a minimum of one person a day. Can we all do that? One person a day that we, when we pray isn't us. If you're more experienced in prayer, expand your sphere. Pray for your church family. Pray for your community. There's dozens of people printed in the bulletin every single week. Are we praying for those people? If it's hard for you to stay focused in prayer, and if it is, I get it. It's hard for me to stay focused in prayer too. There's a Thursday morning prayer meeting every single week. It's on Zoom. I know a lot of us work. That's okay. But if you have time for one hour on Thursday mornings, all you got to do, email Jill. It's on the back page. And just say, I want to go to the prayer meeting. She'll send you the Zoom info. And it's a lot easier to stay focused when you're there with people praying on others' behalf. Extremely humbling, extremely healthy. Finally, here's a challenge for all of us, especially you prayer warriors out there. It's time to pray for our enemies. It's time to pray for those who oppose us, those who don't like us, those who hate us. It's time to pray for those who vote differently than us. It's time to pray for the ones who have signs in their yard that make us go, Pfft, It's prayer time. That's battle time. That's call to spiritual battle. Pray for them because Jesus already knows them. Jesus already loves them. Jesus already wants them to know him. And he wants us to pray for them too. So is prayer an act of service? Well, is it just a nice religious cop-out? I know you want me to volunteer, but like I pray and stuff. It can be if we let it. But really what I'm trying to say is not cop out of other acts of service, but really anything we do should always be informed by prayer because that is what we're called to do as citizens of the kingdom of God. Pride is a powerful force. It sneaks up on us. I'm going to go for it every day. And it tempts us in a number of ways. Easily confused with our God-given dignity, which is good, pride inflates that dignity and fools us into thinking we don't need God at all. And the end of that story is always destruction. But we have a battle plan to talk back to pride by needing other people and celebrating that need. By honoring other people by giving them the dignity of our attention. And finally, by serving other people, by lifting their names into the throne room of heaven in prayer. Just as Jesus served us on the cross, and just as the Holy Spirit advocates for you by name every day. May it be so in His name. Amen. Let's worship. I'll pray, I'll pray. I'd like to talk about prayer for five minutes and then, and then not pray. Let's pray while these guys come up. Lord, you have given us a word that in just a few verses <laughs> unpacks so much of who we are and, how, and what we experience in this life. There's so much to learn and to follow you is a lifelong practice, but today we, we get a glimpse into a plan for how to not be consumed by the force we call pride. We know that your plan for us is the way of life, the way of salvation, the way of joy. May you empower us by your spirit this week. And may everyone here be open to that empowerment and some new habits as we go from this place, making one more step towards being like you than we have taken before this. Change us, transform us, and make all things new in your holy name, we pray. Amen. Mike, I missed the very beginning of your sermon. Did you talk about how pride is something you practice every day? Did we talk about that? Okay. Sorry. We're going to sing a song we sang a few weeks ago called Resurrender. And if there's anything that you have to, I think we have to resurrender to, it's to letting go of pride. And uh, Lisa's going to lead it, but uh, yeah, stand with us. Turning over tables and calling for a return to our lives upon the altar, the things we did at first. You're clearing out the temple. You're
you're cleaning out the dirt for we are your territory lord we are your church we are your people you are our god we are your temple make us holy like you Children. 
You may be seated. I'm going to use this. So we now receive our tithes and offerings. If you are here in person, you can drop your offering off in the basket. Or if you're online, you can click the give link or drop it in the mail or come by the church. And also, you know, it's January, so we're getting... It's time to do our taxes, and we wanted you to know, hopefully those of you, if we have your email address, you should have received your giving statement, end of your giving statement via email. If you didn't, let us know, and for those of you who we don't have your email address, you'll get it in the mail, but if you have any questions, go ahead and call Kristen Laramie in our church office, and she'll help you figure that out. Let's pray for our offering. Ever-present God, with this offering, we present also ourselves. All that we have been, all that we are, all that we shall become, and our resolve to walk in your way. Accept us and our offering, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. And if today is your first Sunday with us, we're glad you're here. It's great. Um, and I want to encourage you to fill out the Connect card that's in the back of the pew. Hopefully there's one in your pew. And take it to our Welcome Center. You'll find Tammy out there and Kathy, our welcoming coordinator. They'd love to meet you, answer questions you have. Maybe get you a cup of coffee in the wayside, too. I'm just saying. So we, uh, we're just glad to see you. Um, we have two exciting learning opportunities that begin next Saturday. Well, one you heard about from Pastor Mike, Alpha. And I just came back from the Alpha Conference, too, and a few others in the room. And we're a little on fire about it. So we're going to keep talking about it. Um, so Alpha is an opportunity to get acquainted with the landscape of Christianity. If you have questions about Christianity or you're new to faith, this is perfect for you. You might know someone who could benefit from it. Think about who you could invite. Maybe say, hey, I'll go with you. Uh, my friend Joe, he's sitting back there. He came last fall, and he spoke about his experience when he got baptized in December. And um, we love stories like that, and so we're hoping for some more. Um, we have dinner. We watch a video on a specific topic related to Christianity, and we have small group time for deeper conversation. And we'd love to have you and the people you know. Um, so you can learn more in your bulletin or go to our website, uvpc.org slash alpha. And then there's Rooted. Uh, just before Christmas, the la our fall group from Rooted came through with their cardboard testimonies. A lot of you probably remember that, where they talked about where they were at the beginning of it and where they were at the end. It was a pretty powerful experience. So what did they do? <laughs> they, uh, they learned how to practice daily rhythms to help develop a healthy and active relationship with Jesus. So there's daily things to do, and then you come together weekly um, to talk about what you've been learning and grow together. Um, and you can learn more about it at ubpc.org slash events. So the Rooted people and the Alpha people are getting, oh, I should add, Rooted, ha Rooted has three opportunities to participate, one in person, two online. There's probably one that fits your schedule. We'd love to have you participate there. And the two groups are meeting together next Saturday, or next, whoa, next Sunday, 5.30. The Rooted crew is going to meet their group, get their materials, and kind of get to know each other a bit, and Alpha is going to kick off um, and there are all, Pastor Mike talked about serving, and there are two ways in which you can do that related to Alpha. We have dinner every week, and we're looking for people to provide dinner. So if that's something that's calling to you, you could sign up at uppc.org slash alpha. And we also have a prayer team for our Alpha. And if you are a person who might be willing to go a little bit deeper and pray for other people as we've kind of been challenged to do today, there's a place for you. So if that's of interest, on the Alpha page, there's a place where you can ask for more information. Go in there, say, hey, tell me more about that, and we'll make sure to contact you. Also, just in the bulletin, Pastor Mike already talked about it. We've got a lot of people 
um, who are in need of our prayers this week. So take that home, look at it, look at all the events that are going on. We're a busy place, and there's probably something for you. So we hope you'll join us. But let's pray. Father, thank you um, for a challenging topic to hear and learn about today. Pride is absolutely everywhere we turn. And it's easy to point it out in other people, but not so easy to point it out in ourselves. So thank you for prompting Pastor Mike to give us ways in which we can look at ourselves with a new lens, maybe, and start to dig through the pride that we find in ourselves. May each of us who are here, who are watching online, who are going to watch this later to come, later on, may we each think about the people in our lives that we need, maybe not necessarily the people that make us comfortable, but the people we need. Help us to be open to the ways in which we can pray for our people just to get outside of ourselves. Help us to be better listeners. Active listening is probably the hardest skill to learn. And we're asking that you would help us develop it because love listens. And if we are really, truly going to to fight back against pride and really see change right here in our community and in our country. We've got to listen. So help us to do that. Um, thank you for all of this, this message from Pastor Mike today. We're also so mindful of people who have lost loved ones this week, who are living with serious health issues, who are facing life-changing decisions who are who are choosing to seek help for things like depression and anxiety and we ask that you would draw these people near to you for those who need to feel peace that they would feel it for those who need clarity about the choice to make grant it we are a church that is in it together and may we lift these people up may we listen to their needs, and may we walk with them as they go through it. Thank you for being with us this morning. We love you, and thank you for loving us. Amen. We are your people. You are our God. You are your temple. Make us whole. While you stand up, just want to let you know that uh, I forgot to mention when I talked about those headaches, this is an old, old condition that I've dealt with for many, many years. So in case you've never heard that, I don't want you to worry that, oh, is Mike sick? Uh, I'm not, well, I probably am sick in some way, but I don't think that that's the headaches. Uh, it's an old, it's an old challenge, so don't worry about it. I'm okay. Um, that Psalm 8 that I quoted uh, earlier about uh, how God made human beings so amazing. It also starts and ends with a familiar phrase to some of us. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. May you know the majesty of the risen Lord Jesus in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit as you go this week and put away the burden of pride with the freedom of self-forgetfulness by honoring the people around you, just like Jesus did. May that be the case for you. And all of God's people say together, amen. 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 Go in peace.